Hey, we're going through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. We're talking about the Jesus agenda. People always ask, what's the deal behind the Jesus agenda? Because we hear so much about the difference between Jesus and everything else outside of the Gospels. In other words, there's an idea that if it was not in Jesus' words, it really doesn't carry weight. But we find out in his first sermon that he's speaking here, the Sermon on the Mount, that he lays out an agenda that's amplified through the rest of the New Testament. And so, like I shared with, and I know y'all studied this on Wednesday night, and you'll have another study with Dave this Wednesday night or adults before we kick off our study. I don't even want to ask what you're studying this week. Should I? I've fallen and I can't get up. There you go. Y'all are going to be looking at old commercials. So anyway, that's what you're going to do. But uh, I do want to say this. Yesterday morning, we had a great men's breakfast. We had about 50 men together and had a great breakfast and great fellowship. And I want to thank Dusty for doing that and getting all that together and all the guys that helped you cook and set up. and all that kind of, We had a great day yesterday morning. So we've got another one coming up. But anyway, uh, so this past Wednesday, I know the adults talked about it, and I know our students talked about it, is the reliability of Scripture and how reliable Scripture is. And it matters to us that when you're looking at the reliability of Scripture, you understand that this book is reliable. Matter of fact, there's more evidence for the reliability of this book than any book that exists today. So we know that and we can prove the reliability of it. And this Wednesday night, as I'm talking to your students, I'm talking about the victory in the mind. I'm going to help your students understand how truth can set them free from all the lies that the world feeds them. Because right now, we're hearing in our culture that this generation struggles with anxiety, depression, all of that. And all that stuff, the enemy always attacks our brains. If he can get us to think wrongly, he'll get us to live wrongly and it'll mess with us. So I'm going to tell our students about how you can win in your mind and think right in order to do right and make great decisions, okay? But in the Jesus agenda, what we're dealing with today is we're talking about what Jesus is setting forth as to what does the Christian life look like? What is the redeemed life? What is the gospel change in our lives? And so he puts this forth. And so we've been going through this list called the Beatitudes. And the more I read these Beatitudes, I'm sitting there trying to think and listen like the Jews that would be there hearing him talk. What were they thinking? Because what he's expressing is so radically different than anything they've ever heard. But I'm also thinking, why wouldn't anyone want this life? Why wouldn't anybody want a life that's not selfish, not self-centered, not full of peace, not full of mercy, not full of kindness. Why would you not want this life? It's what everybody we're talking about in the world today, where the world needs more love, the world needs to be kind, the world needs to be all this stuff. And yet Jesus is laying out the character of that life. And the reason it's rejected is because it's not on man's terms and it's not on man's time. Because we want to be in control. We want to be the basis for what that is. And when we try to control all these things that only comes in Christ, all we get is a shadow of it. We don't live in the substance of it. And it's a dim shadow that we have because we can't, we can't create in ourselves what can only be brought forth in Christ. So he's talking about here the Christ life, that if we're going to have the life that he's describing in these Beatitudes, it's only going to come because we know Jesus. And so today, I want to talk to you about the integrity of a merciful peacemaker. The integrity of a merciful peacemaker. We're going to start reading in verse 7. It says, blessed are the merciful, Matthew 5, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You see, when I have a holy appetite, we're strengthened and nourished to engage in the ministry of Jesus. And so these three attitudes enable us to rightly handle cruelty, corruption, and conflict. So let's look at it and define these terms that we're looking at. First, the merciful. 
The merciful is a person who is actively compassionate, who acts to alleviate the distress. They recognize the hurt and they act. The merciful aren't just see somebody and they feel bad about the situation they're in. The merciful act to help them get through that situation, to help them get things they need to overcome the situation. So the merciful see a need, that's recognition. They're moved by the need, that's motivation. They move to meet the need, that's action. How's this illustrated? You ever heard of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament? The Good Samaritan, you know, he's the third guy that rides by and he sees this guy beating up on the side of the road. He doesn't just feel bad about him. He stops, he helps him, he gets him a room, he gets him help, makes sure all his needs are taken care of. That's merciful. Now, I got to say this. These attitudes aren't taken in isolation. They have to work together. You are most merciful when you hunger for righteousness. You're most merciful when you are least thoughtful of yourself, when you are empty of self. You're, you're most merciful when you understand that you're acting out of the mercy that you've already been given. You're going to be merciful because you understand the mercy that you've, been have, you've already been given to you in Christ. The merciful are sincerely conscious that they themselves were recipients of mercy, of God's mercy, and if it weren't for God's grace and mercy, they would be condemned sinners. So they're living out this thing that God took pity on us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He recognized something. He was motivated to do something about it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he recognizes our need. He's motivated by love. And then he takes action. He sends his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and raise up on the third day. And so he does all these things. That's the merciful. It's the recognition. It's the motivation. It's the action. It's one thing to see somebody hurt, and it's a whole other thing to act upon that and help them in their hurt. So that's the merciful. And what it says about the mercy is the merciful, they get mercy. So we sit here in verse 7, Blessed are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Not because they earn it, because they've already gotten it. So in other words, the merciful don't earn mercy. They receive it as evidence that they have it. They just get more mercy. So what Psalm 18, 25 says, With the kind you show yourself kind. With the blameless you show yourself blameless. Let me just ask you something. What if you... We're limited to receive only the mercy that you've shown. What if that were the case? What if you were limited to receive only the mercy you've demonstrated? Y'all got quiet. Sitting there thinking about it. But thank God, we got more mercy than we ever deserved. That was grace. So we got mercy through grace. We got something we didn't deserve, which is grace. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. That's mercy. We deserved hell and death, but we didn't get it because in God's mercy and God's grace, he gave us great mercy. We received something. So the more merciful I am in my recognition of his mercy, the more mercy he has for me. And can I tell you something? I need a lot of mercy. I'm the only one in the room. I need more mercy. God bless you all. For all of you, see, none of you showed me any mercy right then, you hard-hearted people. <laughs> so I need mercy. So what happens is mercy breeds mercy. And the merciful people, again, they just don't feel bad. They do something about what they see and help. Okay? Now, the second thing that we're going to see here is the pure in heart. So in verse 8, he says, Blessed are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Who are these people? This means sincere, unmixed, without hypocrisy. There's no fakeness. There's no pretentiousness. They are what they are. A believer who is pure in heart has as their only agenda to please God in their attitudes and actions. They're, again, there's no pretentiousness. They do what they do because they are who they are, and they want to please God. That's the pure in heart. The Pharisees were not this. And Jesus describes the Pharisees problem when he deals with them in Matthew 23 and verses 27 28 he says woe to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for you are like whitewashed tombs 
which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You see, the pure in heart act without expectation or recognition. Their only agenda is to please God in their life, how they do it. So a pure in heart acts with integrity, they act with intention, and they act with endurance and perseverance. So in other words, they're going to be that way regardless of the circumstances in their life because the loyalty to God matters most above everything else. So they, they're pure in heart. Their agenda can be trusted. And so what happens with that? When you meet somebody with pure in heart, you just know what they are. Now listen, the pure in heart aren't perfect. Can I tell you this? The pure in heart aren't perfect. They'll mess up. Their intentions is to honor God. But sometimes if, if they're depending on the maturity of their life, how that happens is different. But the pure in heart can be trusted that they'll do right even when they do wrong. What does that mean? So a pure in heart person acts with great intention, but it's not necessarily, it's messy. Y'all get what I'm saying? And so they might do something that's, not necessarily right. But here's what a pure in heart will do. A pure in heart will seek to be right even when they don't necessarily do right. They'll go back and they'll apologize. They'll make sure that you understand, listen, I'm, I'm going to take ownership. I messed up. I did something that wasn't right. I want you to know that my relationship with God matters most to me. And so I want to be right with you and others. You, you don't get what I'm saying? The pure in heart is most concerned without God. They don't want to be a stumbling block. They don't want to be a halt to anybody. They, they, they don't want to live a careless, reckless life. They want to live in such a way that is pleasing to God, but they don't live in fear and condemnation, but they do live with conviction of being right with God and right with others. That, that's what they want. They want, to, they want their loyalty to be recognizable. They want their loyalty to to, to show forth that Jesus matters more than anything else. So their yes and their no's are centered around that motivation. To please God more than anything else. To be right before Him no matter what. And that people would understand their only agenda is that. That they're authentic. They're authentic. So, are you pure in heart? Could people look at you and say, your highest loyalty is to Jesus? Your highest loyalty is to Jesus. So, I've shared this before. The things I pray for in my life, number one, that I'd be the godliest man my family knows. So, in other words, that they would be able to say, the guy you see standing before you today is the same guy that lives in the living room, the den, the kitchen, wherever. He's that same guy. Now, that's tough. But, I mean, it's important to me that my family doesn't walk around and say, yeah, you see him up there, but you ain't seen him at my house. I mean, that would be devastating. It would be devastating. But the thing is, I want to live a life in such a way that heaven's not a big change. Now, that's a high standard right there, but that's a prayer life, that I want to live in such a way that heaven's not a big change. Because what we're talking about right now is the character of heaven. This is how we'll live in heaven. These are attitudes that we'll have throughout eternity. So we might as well start practicing them now. Amen? So this is what you want to know. Hey, I wonder what we're going to be like in heaven. Read the Bible. This is, kind of, this is, this is the character that we will have in heaven. So you might as well start practicing now. Now, if this doesn't matter to you now, then your, your destination might not be where mine is. Because if you're not concerned with kingdom living now, why are you going to be looking forward to it then? I mean, this is the whole deal of hungry and thirst for righteousness. I want to live like heaven today. Okay. So... That means I, I want a pure heart. I want a heart that is loyal, whose utmost loyalty to Christ. Do I fail at that? Oh, gosh, yes. But here's the deal. Here's the beautiful thing. 
When I fail to recognize that I fail, I'm in trouble. Do y'all get that? When I fail to recognize that I fail, I'm in great trouble. You see that? Can I tell you what messes with people today is Christians walking around like they never mess up? They're, they're, here's the two things. One, Christians walking around like they never mess up. And then Christians walking around like it's okay to always mess up. Y'all get that? First is arrogance. The second, I, I don't even know what that is. Deceit. So I understand that I'm going to sin. Scripture tells me that. But it also tells me how I recognize that and what I do with it. That that should be the exception and not the rule of my life. But if I walk around like sin still rules me when the Bible says it doesn't, then I'm messing up too. That's not pure in heart. That's puny in spirit. That's good right there. That'll be a, we can say that'll be a t-shirt or something, you know. So I'm just saying, and, and for those of you that give me t-shirts, I'm good. I don't need any more. I'm good. So when you walk around and, and you sit there and you, gotta, you, you just understand that. So there's pure in heart. This last thing that we're talking about this morning, though, I mean, this is the one that puts everything into play. See, again, these aren't things that work independently. These are things that work dependently on each other. So when you talk about a peacemaker, I'm telling you right now, the reason it comes down toward the end of the list is because it takes everything else in the list to do it. So he tells us, blessed are those, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, a peacemaker, a peacemaker are those who seek to overcome evil with good as they seek to see people at peace with God and at peace with others. Now, let me just say this. I want to back up because I've got to finish up something. So the pure in heart, they see God. So what are they allowed? They're allowed more intimacy with God. And the more intimacy with God you have, the more, again, there's a conforming presence of the Beatitudes. All of these things are taking us and building us into the character and the person of Jesus. And so now we're this peacemaker. Why is peacemaker, peacemaker in there? And why is it in it? Because it's important to Jesus. What was Jesus? He is the ultimate peacemaker. So a peacemaker, again, are those who seek to overcome evil with good as they seek to see people at peace with God and peace with others. A peacemaker is not a pacifist who seeks peace at all costs. I mean, they don't compromise they don't compromise truth to create peace. That doesn't work. But what they do is they speak truth with compassion in order to make peace, that perfect peace that passes all understanding. It doesn't make sense that people could make peace, especially given conditions at times. But that's what they do. The heart of the peacemaker is in it. So one... Now, here's this. One, what a peacemaker recognizes is that one can't claim to be at peace with God and be at odds with others in the faith community that they live in. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying, man, I'm at peace with God, but yet you're at some angst with somebody in the faith community. In other words, this church body that you claim to be a part of or let me just say this, even in your own household. Now, don't shut me down right now because I'm going to get to a place where some of you might be thinking, okay? So hold on. I know some of y'all are running out there in your thoughts right now because this is what happens when we get aggravated about this whole thing about peace. Oh, well, let me tell you, now you're going to tell me I got to forgive them. Or I know God, I God don't forgive me. I, hold on. Y'all need to calm down. So this issue with peace is this. It's true. I can't be at peace with God if I'm actively grudge-bearing towards someone of faith that I'm in relationship with. I mean, from my wife to my children to friends, whatever, in that body of faith, I can't be at peace with God. But peace with God promotes peace with others. 
When it's possible. Romans tells me, when it's up to me, live at peace with others. All men. Romans telling me that. Okay? So I'm going to do everything possible to live at peace. Okay. The fact that this is even in the text tells us how Jesus thought about it. It's a priority of his. A peacemaker seeks to live in peace with others. But there may also be someone who stands between two fighting parties. And when you do that, you're going to take shots from both sides. You ever been there? When you're trying to create peace and you take blows from both sides... Why are you standing up for them? And you're not really, you're really standing for Jesus. But they'll swear that you're taking the side of the other. And sometimes peacemakers get in that role where they're getting beat up for it from everybody. All sides, they're beating them up. You don't understand it. So you're going to take their side. No, I'm just telling you. No, you're taking their side. They love sides. And you got to choose. You got to choose. It's never to be on God's side. It's always been on somebody else. You know, let me tell you why. Because we always think we're right. Not y'all. I'm talking about people that aren't here today. <laughs> right? Our struggle is that I'm always right. We, I mean, it, it's the struggle of our lives. When we're wronged, we always believe that we were wrongfully wronged. Surely I couldn't have done anything that would make somebody do this to me. And sometimes that may be true, but sometimes it may not be. That's why we always examine ourselves and then move forward from there. And so a peacemaker is one who seeks recon reconciliation. Here's what they are. When it says that they should be called sons of God... To be called the sons of God is to publicly be identified as an heir of salvation because we no know, we know more look and act like Jesus than when we are actively engaged in peacemaking. Okay? So we need everything else of all these other attitudes in order to be a peacemaker because peacemakers operate in this realm of bringing peace to God. So that's the first thing. A peacemaker is often called a soul winner sometimes because they want to see people at peace with God. So I'm reading through Acts and, and the reading plan that I'm on right now. And so I'm reading about Paul and them. And so they're, they're sharing this issue about the fact of Jesus. <clears throat> and they're wanting to see people come to Jesus. And so they're talking about, one, we witnessed his resurrection. We saw firsthand his works. And so we can tell you that it's a fact that he came out of that grave and that he lives today. Because there were. There were eyewitnesses. Listen, there are outside sources that know that Jesus didn't die in a tomb. There were at least 500 eyewitnesses that saw him walking around outside the resurrection. Here's again. And I'm telling you, I'm going to keep going back to this. If this is true... If this is true, and I believe with all my heart that it is, and it's not blind faith. I don't like when people say, well, Christians, y'all just have blind faith. It's informed faith. I mean, here's the deal. Just because you deny truth doesn't mean truth doesn't exist. And I'm telling you right now, here's what Jesus did. So go back to the, go back to the, to the merciful and then being the peacemaker. Because this is so, I mean, this is so important that we get this. Because it's, it, it, it's the termination of how much he loves us when we were so unlovable. And so stubborn. And so caught up in our own self. That his mercy was so great that even in our guilt, because he said while we were yet sinners, he died for us. In other words, he didn't wait for us to clean up to come to earth. He didn't wait to say, I tell you what, I'll go down there when they start acting right. That's not what he did. When I was at my worst, God sent his best. It 
Let that soak in just a minute. When you were at your worst, God sent his best. And I know what some of you are saying. But yeah, I, I really haven't been on that bad. I mean, I, I understand your story where you were a scoundrel. I don't hide from it. I mean, I was. I was all those things. I mean, all the things you could be as a lost person, I could be. As far as what we decide a lost person is. Drunk, womanizer, all those things. Liar, cheat, thief. I just, this week, just. just focusing on the fact of what God did for me in mercy when he could have left me to die when I was at my worst God sent his best so that I could be the best Some of you sitting here today, and you're you're at this place where you you're saying, "Well, buggy, I wasn't like you. I mean, I, I'm really not that bad. Of a, I mean, I do. I mean, I I'm a nice person. Okay. I mean, I've never stolen. I bet you're going to say you never lied. <laughs> I've never done anything really bad. I hadn't done anything that bad that I. I mean, I feel like a pretty good person. I mean, I feel like. Compared to a lot of, even people that I see naming Christ, I feel pretty good. Mm-hmm. The problem is we're not going to be compared to others. We're going to be brought up next to the righteousness of Christ. And that's the issue. I, I, I'm not going to be compared to, I'm not going to be compared to your faith. I'm going to be compared to his gift. Jesus. And I need mercy to live up to that. I need grace to get to that, but I need mercy to live up to it. And so he made peace with me by giving me his best while I was at my worst so that I could look like his best. Same thing, everybody else. It's all level ground around the cross. And I remind people all the time when they go, well, I really wasn't that bad. And I said, well, let me ask you something. Let's say there's this dude, he's got a thousand apple trees out there. And he told, he told his neighbor, look, there are 999 trees that you can have an apple from, but there's one you can't. That sounds like a pretty good deal. You get 999 trees to eat apples from, but there's only one you can't. That sounds more than fair, right? Right? But the neighbor, he gets intrigued. Why can't he go eat that one? Surely it won't mess with him that I take one apple from one tree. And so he goes in there and takes one apple from one tree, takes one bite from one apple, death sentence. What's bad about that? He was told not to. That's exactly what happened in the garden. So when you sit there and think, I'm really not that bad a person, do you think, do you think that somebody walked into an apple orchard and ate from the one tree out of 999 offered, do you think they deserve a death sentence? Well, no, we'd look at it. Man, what, get a life. You're being too harsh. What made, it, what made it what it was? One, they didn't believe God's word, and therefore they rebelled against God. And they did what it wasn't, wasn't that they... Well, they couldn't commit adultery. There was only one man and one woman. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? And they didn't kill each other. They didn't do anything like that. They just won. So when you sit there and you try to rationalize how sinful you can be or how unsinful you are, recognize what the standard is. And why we need all the mercy we can get, all the grace we can get, why do we need it? To be at peace. 
Because a peacemaker wants peace. They want peace with God, and then it works out from there. If, you're, if you desire to be at peace with God, you'll work to be at peace with others. And a peacemaker wants that to happen. But here's, the, here's what peacemakers have struggle with. Peacemakers are burdened because not everybody's going to take this place. There's some people who are going to reject peace. They're just going to reject it. And that's the burden that we live with, isn't it? How hard is it when you want people to be at peace with each other, people that you love to be at peace with each other, and they don't seem to care to be that way? They both hold to a position of hurt. They both hold to a position of blame. And they don't want to reconcile. Have you ever been hurt when you've got two friends or two family members that are that way and you desperately want them to be at peace but they reject what has to happen to be at peace? Does it hurt? It's a burden, isn't it? It is, gosh, it is gut-wrenching. So think about Jesus. He comes to offer us peace. To eternal life. How gut riching is it for him when we reject it? And that's what you have to understand. Peace, peace is possible, but it's not always acceptable from the standpoint we want our term and our time. So if you sit there and go, okay, so. What's the problem with this lifestyle? Why can't we live like this? I mean, y'all, that's a great question. Y'all ask some of the best questions. Well, in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 3, it tells us, it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink. Here's this diet thing again. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. For you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? The reason that works is because we got diet. We're not eating. We're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. So we're, we're living on this milk. That's one reason we're not living in the heart and the character and beatitudes because we just don't eat right. We're, we're just happy. We're just happy to show up and feast on Sundays and then famine the rest of the week. And that's just it. And so we don't have the strength and the endurance to live what God's given us to live like. And then there are divisions. He said, you you divide yourself. You're still fleshly in verse 3. He says, for since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not... Fleshly, are you not walking like mere men? That means when he talks about walking like mere men, you're just walking like you've never been saved. You've never been redeemed. If you keep going after each other like you keep going after each other, you look just like you've never been saved. You look like mere men. So here's the fact. Can I just ask this question? If he says, if he says that we look like mere men... Would you not think there's the expectation that we'd be more than mere men? If Paul's condemning the fact that we're looking like mere men, do you not think that the expectation would be more to be more than mere men? That jealousy and strife would not be the issue. But then he talks about personalities, preference and personality. See, jealousy and strife is because we all got preference. And then personality. He says, listen. Verse 4, for when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not mere men? So when you're making your decisions about what you believe about the Bible based on the personality that you get. Now, I, this, this always amazes me sometimes. And I, I get it. Some of us like people. We get along with people. Other, I understand that. I mean, there are some people. There are some of you that I would drive crazy if you hung out with me. I would. I mean, I'm just, um, I, just I just know that. I mean, listen, I know that she's got to have the Spirit of God in her to hang around for 35 years. I was, uh, the other night I was talking to a couple of our students, and they said, you, you, you're hard to follow sometimes because you get going somewhere, and then all of a sudden you go, Pew. I'm sorry. Squirrel, Pew. there you go, right there. You know, 
So I, I, I mean, I, I understand it. But see, some of you, some of, I mean, the, we, we get hung up on personalities. We, we follow people by their personalities. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying, hey, listen, you, you attach yourself to Apollos or Paul or Peter. You need to attach yourself to Jesus. And you need to ask, is Paul, Apollos, and Peter, are they right because of Jesus? Or is their personality just a little bit more attractive to me? We do that today. Well, I, I go to this church because I like this person or that person. What about the truth they preach? Well, I, I know, but I just like them. Okay? So here's what we ought to do is we understand something. We, I understand that in relationships, we, we get the fact that we hang out. And by the way, Jesus had an inner circle. Y'all know that, don't you? When he went off to pray, who did he take with him? Come on. Peter, James, and John, thank you. Some of you are going, he had an inner circle? I didn't know this about Jesus. Yeah. Peter, James, and John. So he'd go off, he'd take... Peter, James, and John. And so he'd have to go hang out with Peter, James, and John. I mean, <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, if I'm not going up there, I'm going to be ticked. What's so big about Peter, James, and John? I mean, there's a thing. I mean, I go, Thomas, you, you ever been asked to go up? To my... I doubt it. Doubt I ever will. <laughs> doubt I ever go up there. See, some of you don't know your Bible. Yeah, that's Bible humor. I'm sorry. Thomas was always known as the doubter. You know, never mind. There are some people we just, it's easier to like than others. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And, and who we, it, it, that's not always bad. It's okay. The issue is not that you have an inner circle. The issue is you have an exclusive circle. When nobody gets in. Because of the personality, Okay. So here's this deal. So what, what Paul's addressing here is you guys are making all your decisions based on the personality of the preacher and not necessarily the, pre, the, the truth of the preacher. And that's why you have jealousy and strife and everybody else. And that's why you struggle with these characters I'm asking because you're walking around. You're still claiming a walk that can only come in the worship of Jesus. But your diet's wrong. You got divisions. You hung up on personalities. Your preferences. And all of those things create strife and jealousy and is an indication of immaturity. And you look like you've never met Jesus. That's what he said. But see, the, the Jesus agenda depends on Jesus. It is being so in love with Jesus. It's understanding who Jesus is. Can I tell you today... You're going to see some people baptized here today. Their stories are so cool. Really is cool stories. Um, about what Jesus has done in their life and why they're here today. But, so maybe you're here today, you're just here because you're here to see them baptized. All right. So it's their baptism in Easter that may bring you to church. I'm not being funny here. I'm just saying, well, I understand, I get it. And, and the fact that you don't go to church a whole lot isn't necessarily an indicator that you're lost. I went to church all the time, and I was lost. Okay? Just so we get the record straight. So what makes the difference? When you have a personal encounter... With someone who loves you so much that when you were at your worst, he gave you his best. 
that he would love you that much. It'd almost be like going to someone who's stolen from you, who's lied about you, who's mistreated you, spread vicious rumors about you. And you find out that they're dying. That if they don't get a new heart, they're not going to live. So you think about it. And you think, you know, Lord, I'm good. I love you. I desperately love you. But if they die, they'll go to hell. And Lord, I know they've been nothing but cruel. I know nothing they've been hard and vicious. But what I'm going to do, God, is I want them to have my heart. That's what I want to do. That's what Jesus did. Jesus looked at his father and said, Father, I know they, they've been nothing but rebellious. They've been nothing but grievous. They've been nothing but heartache. They've been nothing but, they've, they've, they've abandoned you. They've been unfaithful to you. But if you'll put my heart in them, they'll belong to you. And so when Jesus died for us, died for me, died for you, what he did is he died so I could have his heart. I could have his life. Even though I was his enemy, he gave me his heart so that I could love like him, live like him, think like him, be like him, even though I was his enemy. What other love do you want? What other love do you need? For more content like today's podcast, click right here. For sermons, click right here. And again, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a blessed day.